separate our hearts and Amen. Good morning. Uh, we do have some hymnals out there. If you would like to grab one, it's, we're going to sing number 328. I want that mountain. It belongs to me. So hard at my unbended name. No longer in the wilderness I'll stay, and so I cry. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of vegetable grow. I want that mountain. who said I wouldn't go and the witness for the one who set me free I'll come from out the wilderness I'll witness now I know I want that mountain it belongs to me I want that mountain I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow vegetable growth. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. One faithless giant upon the crest of Hebron's lofty height has vowed that he's the one to make me flee. I'll climb from out the wilderness and trust Jehovah's might. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. Lift it up now with me. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of vegetable grow. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. The mountain. 
fountain that my Lord has given me. Let every giant of distress and unbelief and sin get ready now to vacate for you see. I've come from out the wilderness, I know I'm going to win. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of vegetable grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. Amen. Good singing. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to sing. Standing on the Promises, number 364. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory to the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Those two songs work together so nicely. The man who said, I want that mountain, was claiming a promise. What promises have you claimed this February? What promises? God has made at least 365 of them. We know that because we've been cataloging them. Promises about prayer, about blessing, about his return, about service. Promises about protection, about peace, about the nation of Israel. At least 365 promises. A promise a day. What promises have you claimed? That is so important.
Is it good? Should I, should I, should I wear the lapel? Is it catching me? You've got to claim those promises. Each one, for the most part, most of them, will enhance your Christian life. That's why God made them to us. These promises are not available to everybody. They're made to saved people. And most of them have a condition attached, a reasonable condition, not, not some unreasonable fine print, a reasonable condition to the fulfillment of a promise that will make your life better. Why don't we claim those promises? Why don't we search the scriptures and see the promises, perceive them, and believe them, and embrace them? Why don't we? And we read about the believers in Hebrews 11. The scripture says that's what they did. That's what Noah did. That's what Abraham did. That's what Caleb did. They saw... They believed, they embraced. They said, that promise is mine. They made all their lives better. And they're enjoying a wonderful situation now. How come we don't do that? How come, Brian? Rob, why don't we do that? I include myself in the number. What is wrong with us? If the boss told you there's a bonus for you every week, you just got to come claim it. It's yours. Man, you'd be there Monday morning claiming that bonus. Why don't we claim the promises of God? I've got another one for you before we pray. What do you think would happen to you If on some particular Lord's Day, maybe even today, you went home and you said, you know what, I'm going to eat a light lunch or no lunch. And me, just me, alone, I'm going to get along with God. Just me. Not my family. Not my spouse. Just me. I'm going to get along with God. Just me. Find a nice, quiet place. I've done this many times, where the sun's shining, you can open the windows, sit in your car, and just be at peace. Have your spot. I've got about 10 where I escape and, uh, and pray and ask God and give him all the time he needs. I'm talking about sometime on a Lord's Day, just you. Clear out your schedule. And almost everything is less important than doing this. And you ask God to show you what in your life needs to be corrected. And you pray, you ask, and you wait. You pray, and you ask, and you wait. You meditate on scriptures. You ponder the worth of your life and the purpose of it. You sing you just give God the whole day. I mean, it's the Lord's day. That's what it was intended to be. The Lord's day. A sanctified, set-apart day for the Lord, which in return is the benefit to us. What if you did that? You began to pour yourself with deep prayers for people to be healed or saved for your family to be restored or a a wayward teen to return home. You pray for others in the church. You you take all the time you need. You don't make this uh, a half an hour, I'll I'll do this. Pastor suggests I'll give God a half hour. No, no. You clear your schedule. This is the Lord's day. Do you think that would make you a better person? Do you? You know, there are many people who would say, I wish I could do that. Well, why can't you? Why can't you? You say, well, today I have obligations. All right, then you make a schedule next week, do it. 
What if all of God's people in Rhode Island did this? Would it make our state a better state? Oh, you know, without a doubt, the following day, Monday, we, it would be so different. Be different at work, different in our conversations. Why can't we do that? Well, I thought about that all week. What if God's people really got serious and said, God, this is the Lord's day, so I'm going to give you this day, all of it, all of it. I'm not talking about make a commitment to do it every Lord's day. Just, just find the Lord's day and do it and say, it's all yours, Lord. And go somewhere and sit down and pray and listen to you and sing and praise, and think on Scripture. Don't you think that would be a great thing to do? What do you think, Barbara? How come we don't do that? You know, Old Testament, entire days were set aside for repentance, prayer, and fellowship with God. Entire days. Sometimes entire weeks. Okay, we stop everything for a week. In a different world it would be. No, we're just going to let tomorrow be like every other Monday, and then Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and no change. And then read the newspapers and say, the devil's so mean, look what he's doing to our country, and and the Democrats, too. And we've done nothing to repair it. Just a token prayer here and there. If it's something that's touching us close to home, then we'll pray about it. Well, I know what the Lord would like. He wants us to fellowship with him. And we can. We can. There's no question about it. May God take our church and transform it. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to rise to the occasion as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Help us to not become entangled with the affairs of this world as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, I beg you to learn how to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Help us lay claim to that which you said is ours and take it, not by force or the world's weapons, but through the weapons you gave us, prayer, a solid testimony, the Word of God, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Help us to be good soldiers, Father, Show us today that we are in a war, a war with Satan, a war for the souls of men, the salvation of a country. Show us, Lord, what constitutes being a good soldier. There are many AWOL, Father. They're, they're sitting at home today watching television, playing golf, or out fishing. Lord, I know there's time and need for relaxation and recreation and vacation. Far too many, Lord, could be here or in the church they attend and fellowship with, and they've chosen not to. Oh, Lord, how that must grieve you. But we're here today, Lord. We ask that you would bless us from heaven. And take our minds off of the things around us and place our hearts and minds securely and, and, and focused upon you. What do you want? Well, that's my question. What do you want today from me and from us? And help us rise up and give it to you. All glory, honor, and power. All praise directed to you, given genuinely and sincerely. All honor, all preference given to you. First choice, yours. 
all authority, full submission in all areas of our life to you. Would you help us, Lord, please? We are feeble and weak and help us to see it, Lord. Help us to see how prone we are to wander, as the song we sing says. How we are so often easy marks for Satan. Help us with these things, Father. We are so thankful that we can gather together and worship you in song and word and deed with joy and humility and thanksgiving and a measure of sorrow over sin. Burden us, Lord. Make the burden so heavy that we have to pray that there's no relief unless we do. We have to look for promises to to show us there's hope, Lord. Put, put us in that kind of a burden. We have to turn to you and your ways to find any relief. Like so many suffer all around the world, you have so lovingly spared us. Lord, we know to whom much is given, much shall be required, and we haven't given you what you require. So look down upon this church today, this assembly, whether we're all here or not, look upon the assembly itself and bless us and teach us. Correct us, rebuke us if necessary, exhort us, challenge us, lead us, comfort us. Oh, Father, you are such a wonderful, wonderful person. And you sent your son, so lovingly you did it, a great sacrifice. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our substitute, standing in our place and taking our punishment so that we could be saved. Help us to appreciate these things so much, Father. We can do nothing but submit to you and love your son, we thank you today, Holy Spirit, and we thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit, and to you too, Lord, for in your departure from your bride, you sent him in your stead. We thank you today. We have one living within us who will help us if we want help, who will help us to do everything that you told us to do. We thank you. Oh, Father, please, I plead with you. Help us, Lord. Help us to become what we are supposed to be. Help us to be first fruits, a kind of first fruits of your creatures. Do this, Lord. Help us to assemble, not in vain, but to a great benefit and edification. We pray for revival in New England, Lord. Touch the hearts of preachers, churches. Show us the need, show us the pathway to restored blessings. Bless the work in Portsmouth today as we make our plans for a launch in Providence on the 11th of July, Lord. Help us. Help us here. Now, Father, what shall we say? We say this, Father, glorify thy name. And do this for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Behind us, we have um, some of the construction taking place. We'll need the expertise of one Carl Mercer to get the door in and to show us what we didn't do right and fix it and some further ideas. But we want to get all this done. Baptistry is up there, as you can tell. Did you wonder what that was? You didn't think that was a big coffin, did you? Okay, that's the baptistry. <laughs> So there you'll, you'll be able to see folks being baptized. There won't be all of this in front of it. And uh, we've, Brian's been working on that. We've got a, a drain in and uh, be able to empty the baptistry easily, uh, a better heating system for the water, to heat it up more quickly. And then we'll have, um, after folks are baptized, they'll be able to step down, and uh, I'll be able to just step into a little alcove here and change 
rather than stand over there and have folks hold boards up to shield me from you. That's the way we've been doing it, right? Kind of crazy. O-A-K-O. But telling all the women they've got to stay back there so I can change up here. How crazy. Can't, I can't believe we've done stuff like that. So <laughs> we'll be able to work, remedy that situation. Be praying for each other. Pray for Debbie. How are you doing today? Good. Tolerable? Yeah. Do what the doctors did or the nurses. One to ten, what's your pain level? Come on. I just got in the habit of telling them. It really was the truth, no pain. And they couldn't understand that. Yeah. 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 I got to see. I get a tummy ache the moment I take them. I, I'm taking seven. How many taking more than seven here? Debbie, how many are you taking? Yeah. Oh, how many different? This is what we do on Sunday morning. We compare meds. I've taken seven. Who's got more than seven? You take more than seven? Wow, Patty, you take more than seven? I'm trying to whittle that down to three. I don't like them. I don't like taking meds. I haven't taken. That's part of my problem. I quit taking my meds back in uh, 2012. All of them. Done. But that was probably not smart. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, you go through what we went through. You don't mind, okay? All right, I'll do it. I went from not even wanting to look at a doctor to whatever you say, doc, I'll do. I don't know if I just have a high threshold for pain, or my body has no nerves in it that. You know, every single nurse or doctor, once they started attending to me, they'd say, where, where do you have pain, Mr. Baker? I said, no pain. None in your stomach? No. Your chest? No. You have no pain in your side? No. Your neck? No. Well, why are you here? <laughs> yeah, I did not know this, but uh, it's a good thing, I guess, you don't know everything when you're in the hospital. Uh, Every, everybody, the first time dealing with me, they, they'd stare at this part of my neck. Sometimes the nurse would even feel it, and I said, what are they doing? What's the big deal here? So finally, about the next to last day I left, I said, Doc, what's this thing about my neck? Oh, they said, oh, for a long time, you could literally see your vein bulging out with your heart beating. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. I said, I'm glad I didn't know that. I've been frightened to death. They said, no one told you? I said, no. Oh, all right, let's pray. Let's pray. We did? Did we pray? We did pray. We did pray, you're right. Okay. I know, I know, the next doctor you see needs to be a shrink or something. All right, I know, I know. You do start forgetting stuff. I'll tell you, hospital stays can really take a lot out of you. They really do. You know. All right, what are we doing next then? Um, oh, passing out some papers. Garrett's going to come and sing. And uh, Styx is going to be so good today. He's such a good boy. He's going to pay attention to his dad's song. Rob's going to start passing out some papers as soon as Garrett's done singing. If you need uh, worksheets for the Sermon on the Mount lessons, please take one. All right, Tom, you want me to wear this? I was going to sing. I'm just going to read a few portions of scripture from uh, Hebrews 11. Pastor mentioned it this morning. I'm just going to read a few, a few verses, and then Mackenzie's going to start playing, and then I'll start singing. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hands, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophet saw a day when the longed-for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the world by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. Take our Bibles, open up to Matthew 5. If you have a lesson sheet, don't take one. You carry them with you, stick them in your Bible, bring them to church. To worship, I should say. Remember, the purpose of discipleship is to create soul winners. If 
Discipling is what we do when we teach. When we teach on the Lord's Day and when we teach in the Bible studies, it's all about discipleship. Your uh, lesson sheet should say the first law of discipleship, the law of recompense, Matthew 5, 3 to 12. Jesus has been making converts and calling them to follow him. He said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men, Matthew 4, 19. And one day he went up a mountain. Those that were saved and willing to follow him because they were saved, followed him up the mountain. There's no doubt some were saved and stayed at the foot of the mountain. They didn't follow. They said, we're too busy. We have other things to do. We still love the Lord too. We're just not interested in following him. Well, when you choose to not follow, you also choose to not learn the way you should learn. It makes sense. If you want to learn, then you'll go to where the teaching's taking place and learn. If you don't want to learn, you'll say, well, you know, why follow him up the mountain? <laughs> it's a rugged walk, I've got things to do, and I'm not really interested in learning. But if you don't learn, your life won't change. Just marginally, you'll be different. Over time, some things will change, but not the way they should and not in the time frame they should. So you won't be a transformed person. You'll be saved, but not transformed the way you should be. And if you're not transformed the way you should be, you're not going to be obedient the way you should be. And if you're not obedient the way you should be, you're not going to be blessed the way he wants to. So blessings come from obedience. Obedience comes out of transformation. Transformation comes out of learning. Learning comes out of following. Do you all see that? They followed him. He taught them. He let them, uh, they let him change their life through the teachings he gave. They began to obey because their lives were changed. And then God began to bless them. Well, that's the way it works. You make it sound like a formula, Pastor. Well, it's not a formula per se, but it, it really is a pattern that is a biblical pattern, and you can count on that pattern to, to be uh, true. If you do it this way, it'll come out this way. There's no question about it. No question about it. You get saved, amen. Now you're going to go to heaven when you die. First thing God does for us is he declares us to be new, forgiven. Tells us we are what we really aren't. He tells us that we're children of God, we're, we're adopted into the family, uh, we're new creatures in Christ. We're salt and light, we're ambassadors of his, we're uh, members of a high and holy priesthood, and all of these things, he says, this is what we now are. We say, well, I'm not really that. Maybe I should be, but that's not really what I am. God said, well, we'll fix that. The Holy Spirit living within you, and if you start to follow and learn and grow, this is exactly what you'll become. You'll become what you are. And we say, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I want to walk that road. Talk more about that in our preaching later. So he goes up the mountain, he sets himself, and uh, they listen to him teach. Uh, that's Matthew 5. And I want you to just to flip real quick to the end of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Go to chapter 7 for just a moment. And notice there in verse 24, look at what he says. At the end of the sermon, to those who followed and learned. Not to anybody else. This does not apply to all saved people. You can be saved but not learning. But if you're saved and learning, my, then great things are going to happen. This explains why so many do not enjoy their Christianity 
and find it the most exciting thing that's ever happened to them because they're not letting God change them. They look at their life and say, you know, not a whole lot has changed. Well, that's your fault, not God's. God says uh, he, 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 he forgives you and he, he declares that you are now something, something wonderful. Now it's up to you to become that, to grow into being that person. If you don't want to, you, you, he won't make you. But if you do, boy, your life will change, and you'll enjoy it. And it's not half in, half out. It's all in. It's when the Lord says, follow me, you follow him. It's when the Lord says, this is what you need to do today, you do it. Half in folks say, well, you know, let me think about it. I know I'm following you, but that don't mean I've got to do everything you tell me to do. Jesus said, oh, yes, if you're going to follow me, you've got to do what I tell you to do. That's what he said. If any man will follow me where I am, there he'll be too. So don't, don't, you can't go half in, half out. You either follow the Lord or you don't. It's like saying I can be half saved. You can't be half saved. If you called upon the name of the Lord to save you, understanding that you're a sinner, he's the Savior, and he saves those who come to him, and you believe all of that, and you call upon the Lord to save you, you are saved. But you didn't get halfway saved, and you didn't call upon him halfway. You're either saved or you're not saved. And if you're saved, you're either a disciple or you're not a disciple. You're not a half disciple. No such thing. You're either following him or you're not. Now, if you're following him, then you want to learn. And you're here to learn. And if you learn, then God will change the way you think, and that will change the way you speak and live. And if the way you think, speak, and live is changed, you'll start to obey God in ways you didn't before. And when you start obeying him, he starts to bless you. All of a sudden, you see a prayer answered you never thought God would do. You find yourself protected for something you didn't think you'd be protected from. Or he provided something that you needed but didn't know where the provision would come from. Or you have a peace that passes all understanding and you don't have to have it in a pill. He can give it to you. That's blessing. Well, these chose to follow, so he gave them a lesson. At the end of the lesson, he says, whoever hears these sayings of mine, whoever sat here listening and does them, for some people listen and then don't do, whoever hears these sayings of mine and do with them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, that's trial and tribulation, and the floods came and the winds blew and blew upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. That's what you want your life to be that the devil can assault you, chase you, track you down, spy on you, uh, put out notices to, to be alerted whenever you're having a bad day, and you'll be able to withstand all of that. And when the trials of life come, like uh, you have bad news about your health or your wealth, you can stand that too. Why? Your life is founded upon a rock. You're okay. You know what's going to happen to you when you die. You know what's going to happen to you if all your money is gone. You know what's going to happen to you. You're set, safe, secure, and serene uh, in the embrace of God. And that's how you live every day. No matter what happens to me today, I know one thing. Uh, you hold me in your hand. And so you can live above all this other stuff. In the Sermon on the Mount, he starts out by giving them the Beatitudes, that's what we call them, the blessings. And uh, the blessings basically are, if you become this kind of a person, this is the kind of blessing you'll have. It's all about God blesses obedience, and he gives them as this opening portion the blessings because he wants them to know that you made the right choice in coming up here. It cost you something. You had to put away your fishing net. You had to set aside uh, uh, the trip to the marketplace. You had to rearrange your schedule, the schedule you've become comfortable with all your life. But your routine had to be changed to come up this mountain because it never had to do that before. So 
Right? Everything had to change. You had to take your life and say, okay, I've got to rearrange my life, the life I've become comfortable to living on my timetable because I like to go to the market here and I like to mend the nets here and I like to be fishing here and I like to feed the kids here. You had to rearrange your entire schedule, redo everything so you could come up here and listen to the teaching. And the Lord says this, just want you to know you made the right choice. Because if you stick with the program, you will become a happy person. Lesson number one. It's one of the phrases we use so often from this pulpit, God blesses obedience. Obedience brings blessing. And it's found all over the scripture. And here we call it the law of recompense because that word recompense is a Bible term. It's a Bible term. It's how God pays back. He pays back evil for evil. He pays back uh, obedience for blessing. You disobey, you get chastened. You obey, you get blessed. The law of recompense. The scripture says this, and it's with regard to either chastening or blessing. God will recompense his people. God will recompense his people. A great word. It's built off the word that we would use for compensate. This is what you did. This is your compensation for what you did. It's called recompense because it's basically a payback. God will recompense his people. No question about it. You're either sowing blessings or sowing cursing. You're putting seeds in the ground every day, and those seeds are going to produce something. If they're seeds of disobedience, chastening's on its way. Unless you find mercy and forgiveness through confession to God. Or blessings on its way. What you sow, you'll also reap. That's what he says. That's the rule. That rule is as, as uh, clear and as definite as the law of gravity. You drop something, it's going to fall. You can count on it. You don't drop something and have it float up. On our planet, the law of gravity rules. No violation of it. And the laws of God rule. And the law of recompense is the rule. So in your lessons, Jesus said that before we commit, we should. Now, I did not give you this in the scriptures, but let me give it to you here. In Luke 14, the Lord said this, count the cost. A soldier doesn't, a king doesn't go to war without counting the cost. A man doesn't build bigger barns without counting the cost. He said, count the cost. So before you follow, uh, before you choose to commit yourself, uh, let's do accounting. Let's count the cost. And it's not hard to count. You're either going to obey God or disobey God, which is equivalent to obeying the devil. Is that true? So let's look at it this way. I'm either going to obey God or obey the devil. If you don't do what God wants you to do, you're doing what the devil wants you to do. It's very simple. And you have to do the accounting right. Hey, guys, we're counting the cost. Before you came here, did you count the cost? Yeah. You didn't just get on the plane and fly here, right? You said, we're going to pay this much money, and, uh, and we're going to, why are you doing it then? To have bad things happen to you? No, no, no. We're willing to pay this money and get on this plane because we want good things to happen to us. We want to go and meet people, see folks, refresh fellowship, right? Get a vacation. You counted the cost before you did it, though. Yeah. Count the cost. Obey God or obey the devil. Now, let me count the cost. If I obey God, and this is with any act of obedience, if I obey God, God will bless me. If I disobey God, 
the devil will give me a moment of pleasure and then God will chasten me. Whoa, wait a minute here now. If I obey God, he'll bless me. If I obey the devil, I get a moment of pleasure followed by chastening. Hmm. Let me do some more counting. If I obey God, in the end, it really won't cost me much because he will help me obey him. He'll give me strength and guidance and surround me with folks who can help me. So if I obey God, it doesn't cost me much. But if I obey the devil, he's going to rip my hide apart, wreck my life. It's going to cost me a ton in the end. So if I obey God, I get a greater blessing, and it costs me less. If I obey the devil, I forfeit the blessing, risk chastisement, and it costs me a ton. That's how you count the cost. Now, he doesn't say count the cost so that you might say it's not worth it. He wants you to count the cost accurately so that when you do count it accurately, you say, this is a no-brainer. The only course to take, if I have any sense, is to do what God tells me to do. You all understand. So why do we calculatedly disobey? Why can someone give testimony after testimony after testimony based upon the promise of God about how to raise your children or about tithing or about giving to the poor or about praying with passion, fervently? And we hear these things and we hear these things and we hear these things and we, and we, and we know that we our children will return to us if they go astray. God will open the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. God will hear and answer our prayer. And we say, ah, it's not worth it. I think I'll do what the devil tells me to do. Why do we do that, brethren? Why? I mean, you're not the only ones. It's me, too. I'm not here pointing a finger at you. I said, why do we do this, brethren? And God forbid I ever stand up here and say, why do you all do these kind of things? If any of us have any success in these areas, we can only say this. We do these things better than others. But none of us get it completely right. But we should strive to. I remember when I wasn't praying People would say, you need to be praying. It would go in one ear and out the other till one day I realized I am giving up answered prayer. There are things God would do for me that he's not done because I didn't pray. What am I, stupid? Or tithing. What am I, dumb withholding uh, what God tells me to give him? He calls that robbery in the scriptures. And he said he'll bless me materially if I give to him what he requires. What am I, stupid? God showed me I was. I've shared the testimony with you. I mean, there were so many things that when I was instructed about tithing and refused to. Now, some people don't tithe out of ignorance or don't pray out of ignorance. That's different. I was taught to. And when I chose not to, I would find out that sometime during that week or that month, something came up that was totally unexpected, and uh, I ended up with that same amount of money I would have had had I tied. I was like, wow, I'm not a dumbbell. Math is my favorite subject. And I'm thinking, you know, I would have tithed $56 this week. And uh, my wife just had to have a tooth fixed, and it cost $56. Things that make me go, hmm. <laughs> and that happened to me two or three times. I blew a tire and damaged the rim on my beautiful 74 Monte Carlo. Oh, I love that car. Can't even find one like it today. And it uh, cost me the same amount of money that I should have tithed for a month. 
It was like $204, which, which would have been a month's tithe. I banged it, flattened the tire, damaged the rim, $204. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, these figures don't match coincidentally. I think God is trying to show me something. Now, I could have chalked it up and said, wow, it's a good thing I didn't tie. <laughs> then I wouldn't have had money to pay for the tire. No, that would have been backwards thinking. Good thing I didn't tie that week. I wouldn't have had money to pay for Nancy's tooth. I was too smart to think that way. I knew that those things were unusual things that God let happen at that time. And so then I had to say, you know, I don't know how this works, but this is a promise. And I would listen to people now start talking about this promise of God. And they would say things like, well, your 90%, God can make go as far or further than your 100%. Now, that didn't make sense to me mathematically. But that's when I had to say, well, you know what? They're not lying in their testimony. Maybe God does something supernaturally or miraculously to make that work. Yeah. And then how about this one? Uh, you can live uh, better on 90 than you can on 100. I thought, well, now that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I'd already learned a lesson about this kind of math. I learned it academically. I didn't learn it in practice, like, to my shame. This is what someone said to me. You can get more work done in six days, Pastor Baker, than you can in seven. My first question was, how does that make any sense? And then this is what I was told. Did God rest on the seventh day? Yeah. Does he want you to? Yeah, but. No, no, no buts. Yeah. So if you rested one day a week, you think you might have more productive productivity the other six? You got a little rest? I had to agree academically. It's a principle I never really did apply. I do now. Too late. But God's math is not our math. You think it's going to add up the way you add up all the time. You're wrong. Yeah, thank you. That's right. How I wish uh, 36 years ago I took every Monday off. You see, biblically, I don't, I don't believe we should take two days off, to be honest with you. Now, our jobs mostly let us, but as a preacher, I never, I never took two days off. Usually didn't take one day off. That's wrong. And didn't let the people who worked with me take two days off. That was wrong. God took a day off. If your job lets you take two, fine. But be productive one of those two days, but give the other one to God. Give the other one to God. We already talked about that. So we need to believe these promises. No matter what they are, we need to count the cost. And he's letting them know, you whoever, whoever you are that counted the cost, you counted it right. Because you did have to make some sacrifices to be here. You did. He's telling them this. You, you made sacrifices to be here. But if you become this kind of person, man, you're, you're going to be so glad you made those sacrifices. So he opened his mouth in verse 2 and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. Now, we're reading these. Let me read them more slowly. We'll go back to three again. Let's read slowly. We have just a few minutes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, the first four blesseds, the first four blesseds have to do with an inner change. Now, God wants that inner change. Don't think he doesn't. That's where it begins, inwardly. The second four basically are outward manifestations of the inner change. And God wants that too. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's humility. Not proud, poor. Lowly in spirit. You don't think you're someone... 
you think you're no one except what God says you are. When I say you're no one, that doesn't mean you're worthless, you're a worm, no. To be poor in spirit means you don't think you're a big wheel. You don't think you're better than others. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners, present tense. Present tense. I am the least of the apostles, present tense. I am the least of the least of the saints, precious present tense. O wretched man that I am, present tense, present tense, present tense. Paul, no, 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 you don't mean that. That's what you were, not what you are. No, he said, that's what I am. Paul, how could you be the chief of sinners? We've already covered this. For those that are relatively new in our church, it's a very simple thing. If you were to sit on a the witness stand and swear on a Bible, make an oath that you're only going to tell the truth about what you know to be true. Not what you suppose, not what you think, not what someone told you, but what you know, know to be true. And uh, the judge said, okay, now what I want you to do is write down the sins of the ten worst people you know. But you can only write down what you know the sins are. Ten worst people you know, that you know. Ten worst people, write down their sins. Only the sins that you know, not the ones you suspect or think. Oh, come on, I I know guys like that. That's what they do. No, sins you know that you can testify to. I know, I know that guy did that because I heard him do it, I saw him do it. That's what you testify to. Then, Paul, over here we got your name, Testify to all the sins that you know about you. You know whose list should always be longer? Whose? Your own list. That's what Paul's saying. If I'm to to testify to what I know to be true, I'm the worst sinner in the room. I can suspect or guess or think or surmise whatever I want about you but I know everything about me. There's no guessing. So there's no room for pride. No person in this room should say, you know what, I'm better than him. It doesn't matter what he did. You did worse, you did more. Especially when Jesus tells us that the commandments really come down to an inner thing, not just adultery, but lusting. Right? Not just murdering, but hating without a cause. You start putting it that way, your list is going to be a whole lot longer if you testify to only what you know. Your list will be way bigger than everybody else's. That's what Spurgeon used to say. Moody followed him later on when he heard Spurgeon say it. It was was something both of them often preached, that don't worry about what other people say about you. In reality, you know it's worse. It is, and true. That's what humility is. To treat others as if they're better than you. Blessed are they that mourn. That's an inner thing. This mourning is over sin. Does your sin and the destructive sin of others in their lives cause you sadness? Or are you one of those who say, well, yeah, I don't like what I do, but no one's perfect, and whatever they do, they're going to get what they deserve, so that's not the way it should be. I'm glad he got caught. No, no, that's not good. I'm sad he got caught. I'm sad he was doing it. Now, if it's a crime with people being hurt, that's different. We want criminals caught and apprehended if they're going to be hurting people. But so many times people are doing what we have done and we, and, and we don't like it. Well, we don't mind we do it, we do, but we don't like when they do it. When they do, we say, well, why, where's the cop now? Oh, he got caught. I'm so glad he got caught. Oh, he, it's not going to be good for his family when he's got to pay that big fine. That's a sad thing. Blessed are they that mourn. Now, he's not saying it's wrong to mourn over someone dying. That's okay, but you know what that really is? 
That's a, that's a result of sin, isn't it? Had there been no sin, nobody would die. The only person that died who, who didn't sin was Jesus. So it's okay to mourn over sin. We're not saying that's, that's not right. But in, re, in the end, it's still because uh, their death is because of their sin. Had they not sinned, they would not die. Sometimes we mourn when people die because it's just so sad to see what sin has done to this human race. Jesus is at the tomb of Lazarus and he's weeping. I think he was weeping. The scriptures implies this. They were all weeping. Then Jesus wept. I can't go into details about this because we don't have time and it's too, we're, we're out of time now. But last night I spent some time I'll be transparent and those of you watching by YouTube, we are transparent here because we want people to learn. Uh, there's a song called In the Ghetto. Have you ever heard it? Some of you have heard it? When the first time I heard it, I thought, well, that's one of my favorite songs, and it has been to this day. I don't have it on my phone or anything like that. And only one artist that I know ever did it. Who did it? Yeah, Elvis. I don't know anyone else who's ever done the song. I found out one of the reasons, maybe last night. This song was tested to a black audience, one person at a time. Come listen to the song, and we want your reaction. You know most of those people started weeping. Things like this. White folks thought that way back then? One of the most popular singers ever sang this song publicly and made a record? Never knew it. Never knew it. And the song is a very deep song. In the end, the person dies growing up in the ghetto. And all these folks listen to the song, they all start crying. Guys? Gang, gang guys? Rappers? Gangster rappers? They all start crying. I mean, somebody cared back in 74 or 73? Somebody cared? They're weeping. You know, I started crying. Oh, this is amazing. My, these people, they, they think we don't care? They're surprised to know that white people care? They should know we care. How could they not know? But whether they should know or not, the fact is, I, I believe all, every one of them, they did not know that any white person would ever even think of singing a song like that. And it broke their heart to, to know that they were wrong about that. And the fact that it's still the same thing today, 40 years later. 46 years later. So, the whole thing, all the weeping was because of one thing, sin. Sin of white folks, sin of black folks, <laughs> resulting in death, a mom's broken heart, and an apathetic society in many ways that can't figure out how to help in a better way than we have. And I don't know the answer to all the questions. I'm not into the debate about it. The fact is it's a reality. A lot of these folks don't think we care. And so if you care, good. I care why we want to have a church in Providence. I care, and I know many of you care. Maybe all of you care. But one thing is true. The black society doesn't think we care. And that's sad. That is sad. That somehow enough has not been said to let them know we really care. Blessed are the meek. Those so are people who have chosen to not get their way by intimidation. That's what meekness is. The best way to define meekness is to look at what the opposite of it is. The opposite of meekness is intimidating. You would never call an intimidating person meek. Could Jesus have pulverized everybody who threatened him? Could he have? He could have wiped them out just like that. Boom! Fire come down, consume them all. He chose not to. 
Could he have said to the woman caught in adultery, and there's, in my mind there's no mistake, she was caught in adultery. Could he have uh, said, stone her? I consent. Could he? Could he have said to the man who for 38 years tried to get into the pool at Bethsaida and uh, no one helped him? Could he have said, listen, if no one helped you, why should I help you? What must be wrong with you? Could he have said that? Could he have said to blind Bartimaeus, the beggar, why should I bother helping you? I'm sure you did something to deserve this. You're poor. Don't you know there's programs to help you? How could you still be poor? He didn't do that. Uh, he has pity on people that we would not have pity on. We say, you made your bed, lie in it. He said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. No, that's what meekness is. You don't mind being what the world would call weak by helping people who are weak. And then uh, lastly in verse 4, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. You just want God's will to be done. You want to do God's will in your life. You want others to do God's will. You're, you're just hankering. You're yearning. You're hungering and thirsting is the way he puts it. Maybe no better words to describe it. You want what God thinks is right to be what is done. Those are all inner things. This is what God wants to change us into being like. Humble people, sorrow over sin, not intimidating, and wanting to see right done. That's what he wants on the inside. That's not the way we naturally are, brethren. Some people's personalities might lend themselves to being somewhat like this, but none of us are really like this till we, till we get saved and start letting God change us. And he will do that. Let's bow our heads to pray. We need to take a seven-minute break. Don't leave. Get right back here. Use the restroom. Sing the song. Stretch out. Come right back. And we'll talk a little bit about blind Bartimaeus, and, and uh, then we'll observe the Lord's table. Uh, why are we here today? What is pastor supposed to be doing from this pulpit and teaching others to do? The work of discipling. Is that right? Let's, let's be discipling. And let's, let's be discipled. Father, bless the teaching of your word. Now prepare us, Lord, as we look into this episode in the life of the Lord Jesus, whose life we know so much about, so much we don't, but so much we do, and his confrontation, his meeting with a man who, about who we know very little, a man who very few of us would befriend, or even give a moment of time to, your son did a magnificent thing for him. Help us as we work our way through that passage. Bless our break time and our song. And we do plead with you, Lord, change us into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Brian? Uh, 377, rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Perishing care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring ones lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful. Jesus will say though they are slighting him still he is waiting waiting the penitent child to receive plead with them earnestly plead with them gently he will forgive if we only believe rescue the perishing care for the dying Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. 
All right, let's take just a few minutes and uh, take a break, stretch out a little bit, uh, head to the restroom if you need to, and we'll come back in just a couple minutes. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus us will sing. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Amen. Please be seated. Bible of Mark. Again, let's be good students of God's Word. Julie, how are things going down there in Virginia? Amen. Church doing well? The 
people able to meet at the building? Wow. Or a YouTuber, I'd say, here we just do it. No, it's 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 a risky proposition because you can get it all built and then have them tell you to tear it all down. I've seen that happen. Amen. So let's look there at Mark chapter 10. Interesting passage. It really could be two sermons, but I do think they're connected. We won't spend as much time on the first portion. But just to see uh, kind of like the backdrop of what's going to happen and uh, a little bit of context. We pick up there in verse uh, 35, Mark 10. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now these are disciples who were then later named apostles. Many disciples, 12 apostles. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. That's a big request. I mean, really. When you rule, when you rule as the king, you've already said that we're going to be priests and administrators and governors and and all that in your kingdom but you haven't said who's going to sit on either side of you, could we be the two that do? I mean, we were among the very first that you called to follow you. We were among your first converts. And I think that's what's behind this. That's all I can surmise. We were among the very first, so could we have a seat right next to you on either side in the kingdom? But Jesus said unto them, verse 38, You know not what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? In essence, what he's saying is, uh, you want to be on a par with me. I don't think they understood it that way. You want to you sit there with me. You, you want to be on a par with me. You want to be recognized just under me in your greatness. You want to have a position of honor just below mine. Don't think you know what you're asking. Can you do the things I'm going to do and go through what I'm going to go through? And they said unto him, we can. And Jesus said unto them, and this is very interesting, he acknowledges that that's true, they can. You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with all, shall ye be baptized. He said, you've got that right. That part's right. You are going to suffer the way I've suffered. Maybe not to the degree. But they won't be asked to suffer to the degree. But, but they will drink of the cup that he drinks of and be baptized with the baptism he shall be baptized with. In other words, he'll be ident- they will be identified with his suffering But he says, to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. This is not my call. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. So who would make the decision of who sits on either side of Christ if there was going to be anyone sitting on either side? Whose decision would it be? 
the Father's decision. So he's just instructing them. They have this very big prayer request that that may reveal uh, a misunderstanding. Basically, they want to be recognized for their part in his great work. What about our greatness? We, We have served with you this whole time. We left our boats, our families, we left everything to follow you. Some people follow you by following what you do and what you say, but they still kept their jobs. Like us today, we follow, but we can still, we don't have to physically follow Jesus, right? We don't even know where, where he is. He's up in heaven. To physically follow him, we'd have to die and go up there and be with him. But these were among those who actually said, when you say follow you, we are actually going to just walk right where you are, be right with you. When the Lord says follow today, he means follow me in what I would do. Do what I would do. Let my life be the pattern for how you live your life. That's following. By the way, it's supposed to be all in or nothing. You're going to follow me or you're not, as we said earlier. This is the Father's call, who sits on either side of the Son in his kingdom. It's not not the Son's decision. And uh, verse 39, once again, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Well, who are those guys? What in the world? I mean, we're all following him. We all left something to, to be physically following him, to go from town to town with him. We've all given up something. We, we've... we've who are they? And uh, they don't even know as much as we know. They don't even pay as much attention as we pay. So what if they were the first ones? Yeah, but we know one of them gives a little bit more. Well, so what? We, we, we give of our time. I mean, they're all, they're, they argued about this a lot. It's kind of disgusting when you think about it, uh, that they argued a lot about who was greater. And the word greater is the key word. The word greater, the key word. They're asking for a greater position in the kingdom, aren't they? They're asking for a greater position, and they're asking it because they think they're greater. It may be a humble estimation in their mind, but we're just being honest. We are greater. The Lord does not appreciate that because it's revealing to him, and he wants it to be revealed to them, that they don't know what it is to be great. It's not what they think. It's not what they think. It's not what they think. And if you're going to have your own concept of what constitutes greatness, we're all going to have different uh, concepts. The one who has the most is the greatest. The one who gives the most is the greatest. The one who attends the most is the greatest. The one who's been here the longest, having to listen to pastor preach every week, is the greatest. The one who always shows up to help out at a yard day cleanup, he's the greatest. The one that works behind the scenes and no one knows their name, he's the greatest. I mean, there's all sorts of definitions we can have for greatness. The Lord wants them to know, you guys are not defining the word greatness right. I wonder who's going to be sitting there. Would it surprise you if it was someone like blind Bartimaeus? It would be just like the Lord, wouldn't it? After all, he didn't, he didn't call highfalutin, intellectual, wealthy people into the service, did he? What kind of men are serving him? And men that you wouldn't think would be apostles. I mean, if the Lord said in advance, you know, I'm going to start gathering up some men and name 12 of them apostles and give them tremendous responsibility, and have their names written over the 12 gates and in, in, uh, the 12 doors in heaven, uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, who's it going to be? Who are those 12 going to be? And nobody would think of people like Peter, James, or John, or Levi. Are you kidding me? He's a tax collector. Certainly he's not talking about any of those people. Well, those are the people he called. True? Yeah. You say, well, Paul was educated and probably wealthy, as, as some assume. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, it's assumed. 
Yeah, but he was a Christian killer. Who would have ever thought he'd be named an apostle? If there's anybody who wouldn't be, it would be him. No, the Lord called a whole bunch of folks into positions where we would consider greatness, who we would think, how could that be? How could that be? But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, verse 42, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority. He's, he, he's saying to them this, is this about authority and rule? Is that why you want to be considered great? Is that why you want to have this position of greatness? You get to be a big wheel, tell others what to do? Because that's usually why people want to be considered great, isn't it? Isn't that why people want to rise up the ladder and have more authority? Boy, I, I've known men. Boy, I wish I was a pastor. Why? Well, I get to tell people what to do. You're going to be the guy God won't call. Because that's all wrong. You teach people what God told them to do. That's really what you do. Oh, my. Verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. He said, now among you who are saved and want to do the will of God and follow him, greatness has nothing to do with exercising authority. Nothing. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. The word minister means servant. You mean... The great ones don't rule? No, he said, the great ones serve. That's why they're great. Wow, changes it, doesn't it? Take a man over here who delights in ruling. When I mean ruling, I get to tell other people what to do. And then the person over here who says, I, I like serving people. Which one do you want to be working with and under? Come on. One who serves. One who serves. And whosoever, verse 44, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest. You want to know who's going to be the greatest here in this group? If you want to know who's the greatest one in this group, is the one who's the servant of all. Wow. Okay, Lord, uh, can we retract the question? A prayer request rescinded. We take it back. Because apparently whoever the Father decides to let sit on either side of you or to be, receive recognition and uh, be considered great, is going to be the person who serves the most, and I don't want that to be me. But amongst that 12, and if we count Jesus 13, amongst the 13 people standing there, who was, who was the servant of all? Huh? Yes. And who was considered and is still considered the greatest of all? That's right. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He did not come to be ministered unto. Now, when we get saved, we should want to minister unto. But as I've said many times from this pulpit, God's not going to make any of us do anything. It has to be because out of our love and appreciation for him in reciprocating to him what he gave to us, which was everything, we want to serve him. Right? So verse 46. Uh, God does not place things in scriptures uh, in a willy-nilly, coincidental fashion. He didn't have a bunch of stories and lessons and then shake the can up and roll them out and say, okay, this is how they fell out. This is how we're going to write them down. No, there's a reason. 
and there's a connection. Well, let's pay attention. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Blind beggar. That's how he became known. That's even the way many people refer to him today as the blind beggar. Oftentimes his name is not even mentioned. It's, you know, that blind beggar in the book of Mark? That blind guy who was begging? I've seen him referred to that way many times. His name not even mentioned. That blind guy begging. Now, how many people do you think were eager to help him? Come on. Not many. Not many. Not many. You know it, I know it. You know it, I know it. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, this is the blind beggar, when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming through, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he's yelling. He does not want to let this opportunity go by. Just a thought. How did he know Jesus could help him? How could he know? Hearsay. He heard people talking about the things Jesus did. You know what we're supposed to be doing at work? When the opportunity affords itself without banging on doors of opportunity but letting God open doors of opportunity. You know what we're supposed to be doing? Bragging on Jesus. I mean, how did this man know? Somebody had to say in his hearing, there's a man who can heal the blind. He had to hear that. Somebody had to make known the ability of God to do things that no one else can do. Somebody had to do this. You know who should be doing it, don't you? You should be doing it. Yep. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And then he charged him that he should hold his peace. Shut up, be quiet, will you knock it off? You're being a pest. You're being a nuisance. This is the king coming through. Let's pay him respect. Let's, let's honor him. Where are your robes and uh, palms to lay him before his feet? Can I tell me you couldn't have gotten some somewhere? Don't be a nuisance. All the time you're sitting on the sidewalk begging. About time somebody put you in your place. Would you leave us alone? We're trying to enjoy the parade. And here you are yelling out the top of your lungs. Would you leave that man alone? He's got enough on his mind. Knock it off. Many charge him that he should hold his peace, verse 48. But did the man hold his peace? Because he's cried out the more. Cried out the more. All he's asking for is that Jesus have mercy on him. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. He said, go get that man. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made me be whole. And immediately he followed his sight, he received his sight, and followed Jesus in the way. How beautiful. Jesus is showing them, you want to know what greatness is? 
You want to know how to be great? You want to know how to be exalted by God, where God brings you into a place where you are recognized for what you've done, admire you as a Christian, give you influence over others so that you might influence them for righteousness sake? You want to know how that happens? You serve the blind beggars. You serve the blind beggars. Well, we'd rather serve people who have money. That way they could help us in our time of need. Uh, who's going to help the blind beggars? He said, you want to be great in God's sight? He said, those decisions aren't mine. Those decisions are the Father's. You want to be considered great in the Father's sight? You help the blind beggars. We're good. We're good. You help the blind beggars. Who's helping the blind beggars, brethren? I know the easy answer. Well, the government is. That's their job. Uh, I don't know about that. I think that job's ours first. Ours first. Now, if we don't do it, I'm glad the government does. That's our job. You say, well, I can't heal someone's eyes. Can you make a friend and pray for him? Is it really do us justice in the eyes of God to just say, oh, it's too bad for that guy. It's bad I'm not him, and then walk away? Because that's what we do. Oh, pastor, you're speaking pompously. Do you, are you saying you always help blind beggars when you see them? No, I've already told you this applies to me too. I need an overhaul, too. I think most of us here in this country do. There's not a country on this earth that has more Christians in it, more Bibles in it, more churches in it, more Bible colleges in it than us. Not a country on the earth. We should be leading the way in helping the blind beggars. Do you agree? This is how we need change, brethren. You hear me talk about wicked ways we have to turn from? It's these kinds of things. I want to be great. I want to be respected. I want to be admired. I want people to know that I'm something. The Lord says, wrong motive. God will do that in his time. You have to do this right now. They were saying, we want to sit on your right hand in the future. Future greatness. Future exaltation. Okay, he says, let's define greatness a little better than you guys did. And you got to start now. Let's stop turning our eyes to the plea of the poor and the hurting and the helpless. I don't know what we can do for them, but I know this. We can pray. And in some cases, we can help. And we can always try to bring them to Christ because he's the one who can do things we can't do. But to just let people languor in their spiritual poverty and spiritual blindness or physical poverty and physical blindness is not right. We need deliverance from that. It'll shake us out of our comfort zone for sure, but I think we've gotten too comfortable. Bow our heads to pray. Jordan, come help with the Lord's table. Scott, would you help with the Lord's table? Adam, would you help with the Lord's table? Al, would you help with the Lord's table? God, forgive me for not having a desire to communicate what's on my heart like I am now. For too long, just uh, approaching the method of communication and the reason for it were totally different. So 
but in my circumstances, and Debbie knows what I'm talking about, she's facing similar things. You don't know when your number's up. When you start to limit your days and know that it's, it's uh, not going to live forever, that's for sure. could be over sooner than I think. Uh, it changes everything. Um, let's, let's get on board. Get cleared away with God. Get right with Him. Get right with people. Start learning. Let's stop saying I'm too old. Set my ways. We need young and old to have a tremendous, overwhelming burden to be Christ-like. doesn't matter who you are. If you're saved, He wants you to, to develop Christ-like character. We will take your cooperation. Father, help us to be like your son. Help us not to aspire to anything other than that we be like him. We know that's your goal. That we be conformed to the image of Christ. Let it be our goal, Lord. Not greatness, not recognition, not fame. Let us trust you with that. Let's believe the scriptures, that if we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that you will exalt us in due time. When you think our character and testimony are worth the scrutiny of others is when you place us in a position to be scrutinized. Help us, Lord. As we observe this Lord's table, we want to thank you that your son submitted himself to your plan that he be executed as a sacrifice for sins. That he allow himself to be arrested in a very inhumane way judged unfairly, unjustly, a condemned such in such a callous way, even among his own converts, and then uh, brutally executed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for paying for our sins when we were yet ungodly. Thank you for dying for the worst sin we ever did and the one we keep on doing. Thank you. Thank you for paying the price and, and the ransom. Thank you that now we are free spiritually to live and to grow and to become like your son and to serve others. Thank you that we have an ability to love like we never had Lord, our, our aim is to see that love developed here. And so, Father, as uh, this bread is taken and delivered row by row, help us pause and thank you for what you've done for us, Lord Jesus. May we remember you.